Further to my last podcast on sham contracting and the confusion surrounding PSI legislation and the 80-20 rule and how this all kind of relates to uh, sole operators or virtual assistants, I sought some clarification recently from Ken Phillips, the Executive Director of Independent Contractors Australia. So, Ken, why are the PSI rules there in the first place? So, the the PSI rules are there for very narrow specific purposes, to stop income splitting that's not legitimate, to stop the retention of profit and transferring it to other years when it's not legitimate, and that's really its two primary functions. So if you're a a sole trader and you can't split income, by definition of being a sole trader, you can't split income, the whole PSI thing's not relevant. It really doesn't matter which category you fall into. So PSI legislation has neutral tax implications for sole Sole operators like virtual assistants. And the 80-20 thing, that isn't part of PSI. That's part of something else, isn't it? That's part of an identification of whether you're a personal services business. But that doesn't factor in unless you're operating as a trust or a company. Correct. Correct. Right. Right. So you you set yourself up as a sole operator and away you go and you you don't have to be overly concerned about this PSI stuff, um, the 80-20 rule, none of that because it's it sort of doesn't relate to you as a sole operator. But if you decide to set yourself up. It doesn't have impact on on your tax issues. Right. If you decide to set yourself up as a trust or a company, you've then got to look. Right. So then you've got to look at these tests. Correct. Then that's where the eighty twenty rule can come in as one of those tests, as 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 a, as a subsidiary test. And then they will that will determine whether you are a personal services business. Yeah. And that legislation. Then then, then that to. then that determines whether or not you can split income, whether you can retain profit, and do those other things that that uh, accountants sometimes like to get involved in. The whole lot of heartache over this over absolutely nothing. Yes. Well, again, my, my primary concern with it was the fact that this constantly comes up about, oh, be careful that you're not getting more than 80% of your income from the one source because yeah. then you'll be an employee. And I'm like, no, no, I'm pretty sure that doesn't apply unless, and, unless, unless you're a trust or company. Correct. Right. And so sole operators carry on. But if you're a sole trader, there's only one question you have to ask yourself from the tax perspective, right? Is the expense that I have a legitimate expense necessary for the earning of my income? And so it you, just goes towards deduction? Yes. Can I claim the phone? Can I claim the car? Can I claim, claim my home home office? Can I claim the paper I've, I've used, right? And if your answers on any of those are no, well, you can't, don't claim as a tax deduction. And then the only other thing that you've got to consider then as I discussed, was the payroll tax thing and the workers' comp thing, which yeah. is a sole operator you can't you can't register for anyway. But, but it's whether your client correct, and then that's when we answer the questions about you know how how in control of stuff are we, which makes us independent. Yes, but then under as you say, then under the the workers' comp and payroll tax laws, there are these other definitions that actually embrace some independent contractors in some ways. So that's where that gets real. And as a consequence of all of the complexity with payroll tax and workers' comp, engaging parties often turn around and insist that you have a company or a trust if you're to work for them. Because then if you have a company, the superannuation guarantee laws actually apply to you because you're an employee of yourself. Right. The workers' compensation laws, You are, if you have a company, you, you are required at law to, to register for workers' compensation because you are an employee of yourself. No? It's all stupid. Mm. So to clarify that, though, as it pertains to virtual assistants, who the majority of whom work as sole operators, yep. to avoid the potential, say, for their clients to be then responsible for workers' comp and the payroll tax issues. Yeah. How do they do that? Is that where you come into these, ask these questions about? Uh, I, can't, I almost, almost can't answer that. Right. Because remember what I said about the High Court said about the key test case in Victoria? 
the, the High Court did, doesn't understand the legislation in Victoria. That's right. It depends on the state that you're in and, and, and the, the terms and, of your engagement. And the weird wording. And then at the end of the day in Victoria, the High Court said it depends on the mood of the the interpretation that the, that the bureaucrats choose to put on it. Now, of course, this kind of starts leading to people being nervous, you know, oh, oh, well, what's going to happen to me? Am I going to lose my business? Am I going to still be able to operate? You know, the likelihood of, of coming under the microscope for this kind of thing, and we know that, you know, the government's doing audits and, and that on independent contracting at the moment in various industries. Do VAs have any cause to be kind of worried about this kind of thing or do they just get on with it and keep working? Get on with it. Focus on doing your business. And, you know, look, when you're in business, there are all sorts of things that uh, all sorts of proverbial commercial trucks that are waiting to hit you, right? You accept that you'll, you'll have a client that, you know, you get worried because you say, jeepers, willikers, what if the client doesn't pay me? I get screwed over, mm. right? Mm. Well, that's one of the trucks that might hit you. Do, does that stop you doing your business? Well, you get as intelligent as you can about who, you know, making sure people pay you on time. So there's a whole series of features. You know, what if a flutter hits you? Mm. Mm. <laughs> there's a whole series of things that will hit you in business, and this is one of the risk environments. And government has turned itself into a risk environment for people who want to be in business because Government doesn't even seek to want to understand. On the superannuation laws, workers' compensation, payroll tax laws, government has put a big sign on the on the road upon which you are driving, which says the speed limit is somewhere between 60 and 80 kilometres an hour, and it will depend on the mood of the policeman if he pulls you over as to whether or not you're going to get fined. That's the environment you're dealing with. Right. So and people say, so what do I, speed do I drive at? And, and government says to us, well, between 60 and 80. But you say, you must be able to tell me what the law is. We've told you between 60 and 80. Yes, yeah, so there's this scope. Yeah. Right? But, but how do I know I'm speeding? Well, we'll have to work that out, won't we? <laughs> when it happens, when, when you get happens, caught, after, if you get caught. <laughs> yes, when you're in court, we'll go and talk to the judge. And then he might not even know. <laughs> and the judge will turn around and go, well, on the balance of evidence, you know. Yes, yes. So, you know, welcome to the madness of business. Yeah. Welcome to government that has just no comprehension or desire to comprehend what business is about because they're incapable of making rules that give clarity. Which is ironic because governments really should be run like businesses, shouldn't they, with all the budgets they have control of? Well, you'd think so, but the fact is show me a single bureaucrat or a single politician who personally holds responsibility for the things that they do. Yes. Not one of them. Yes. So when you don't have personal responsibility for your actions, you behave the way King John did that brought on the Magna Carta. The, the issues are all the same that, that happened under Magna Carta. Mm. Haven't changed. All right. Well, then I suppose the thing that VAs can take from this then is just that unless they're a, unless they're a trust or a company, they don't have to worry about the PSI legislation. They don't have to worry about the 80-20 rule. They just get on with working and go from there. Correct. Great. <laughs> All right. <laughs> Thanks, it's it's one of those situations like you have to understand the complexity to actually understand the simplicity. Yes. Yeah, and, and the people who are enforcing it half the time don't understand it either. They don't understand. <laughs> yeah. yeah. What hope is there for us? Yeah. Um, <laughs> and if we get it wrong, we're evil. Yes. You know, we're, tr our, we're trying to rip somebody off. Yeah, it's our fault, you know. Yeah, yes. <laughs> All right, great. <laughs> you know. Still confused? Still have questions? Ken's going to be presenting on the topic of contractor versus employee at this year's OIVAC on Friday, May 20, 8.45am Australian Eastern Time. If you're interested in going along, take your questions with you. Um, you can register for that event at OIVAC.com and follow the links to the registration page. 
I'm Lynn Prowse-Bishop. Thanks very much for listening. <laughs>